And now, time for something just a little bit different. everyone just a little uh a little bit of a uh, showcase just to explain what's going on here this video was supposed to come out a week ago now <laughs> and toho blocked it because i was using six minutes of silent footage from a 70 year old film i explained that in a video i want to take down like right away now because i feel like it gives the wrong impression about how i was feeling at the time i'm just really angry you know and I'm not gonna lie, I'm not sure if this is even one of my stronger videos. Like I would say my Kong and my Sonic videos are way better than it. But at the same time, I don't feel like putting more effort into it because I can't even do it the way I intended because apparently fair use means nothing to Japanese companies. At least Japanese movie companies. I mean, it might be a long time before I do another Godzilla movie. And that sucks because I really love this movie still. But it's an uphill battle, and I'm honestly just a small YouTuber at the time, so what can I do about it? I don't know. I do hope you enjoyed the video, though, what I was able to salvage from it. Um, there's some weird audio stuff. Uh, I didn't. I, I accidentally didn't take out some of the extra takes, but I just want to get this out there, you know? Uh, next week, um, I have a really big video planned to compensate for it, so I hope you guys will all stay. Thanks. All right, Blue Genocide out. Japan. 1945. Seeking a way to end the Second World War, the United States, seeing no other way to end the war, drops two atomic bombs on two major Japanese cities. This worked, but really was a major catastrophe. It was seen as something that needed to happen, and I don't want to dwell on this event, but seeing as the film I am talking about today was made because of this, and the people making the film saw it happen and was there not there but was very very open to see it and maybe lost some loved ones there's no way to talk about this particular film without mentioning it unfortunately there is yet another tragedy we need to talk about with this film that directly inspired the first part of this film i hope i say this right the daigo fukuru maru translated as the translated as the FV Lucky Dragon 5, was an innocent tuna fishing boat that was contaminated by nuclear radiation from a United States test of a weapon on March 1st, 1954. Nearly eight months before the film premiered in Nagoya. Nagoya? I hope I said that right, too. It is a really obscure event now, but it was a constant fear in the entire world, not just in Japan, but the whole world thought it might be ended by nuclear war. It's a, it's a depressing thought that separates this particular film from a majority of its sequels that have come out in the past near 70 years. The other, much less depressing inspirations are other monster movies in this era. In 1952, King Kong was re-released back in the theaters and made more money than ever before. For those not in the know, before VHS and before television was a normal household item, if you wanted to see a movie again, it had to be a theatrical re-release. It saved Disney's ass a ton of times, and Kong got re-releases all the time. In 1953, a movie that came out that's very similar to Kong, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, uh, with Ray Harryhausen doing the special effects, was released about a dinosaur being awoken by atomic explosions. This would serve as the last necessary piece of the puzzle. The film, directed by Ishir Honda, I hope I said that right again, I'm sorry, was mostly a first of its kind, but is predated in odd ways. First off, there is a 1938 silent film, yeah, a silent film in 1938, Japan was kind of slow that way, translated to be named as King Kong Appears in Edo. Unfortunately, it seems like the same bombs that inspired Godzilla may have destroyed this film as well. And it probably hasn't been seen since 1938. Another weird connection with Godzilla is the fact that the man who designed that crazy-ass Kong suit was the same man who designed the first original Godzilla suit. It's crazy to think that Kong wasn't just the first big monster movie besides maybe The Lost World, but he may have even been the world's first kaiju. 
we can't tell because some people say that the the gorilla in that film didn't actually change sizes to be huge and it was just like normal size there's a publicity photo but people think it was faked i don't know either way I should also talk about what I call the four kids version, otherwise known as the Americanization. Godzilla, King of the Monsters, not to be confused with the 2019 film, is basically the same movie but way less dark, with scenes of Canadian actor Raymond Burr added that explain what is, what is going on for a dumbass 1956 American audience. Definitely watch the Japanese original first or over it, but it's not a horrible version like what you'd expect. It's kind of shocking imagining that Americans depicted the Japanese people as cheap, lazy, backstabbing gremlins only a little more than 10 years before this film came out. And they decided not only to release this film in North America, but with a sympathetic look at the Japanese people. Especially considering what happened in 1945, it's hard to remember that this was fresh in the memory of everyone over the age of 12 to about 14 at the time. Like most American plots in this and future Godzilla movies, it's pretty easy to abridge the human lead's plot. The male lead basically does nothing and the female lead is just awful. I guess this is an unpopular opinion since I got downvoted for saying it on Reddit, but any scene she's in, she either starts crying, which sounds more like laughter, and I get that sometimes laughing while crying can sometimes be connected, but not in the context of why she is crying. In this final scene where she gets horrible news, she does it, and I digress. Either way, when she is on screen and not crying, she seems polite, but she just isn't a great actress. Scenes with her I almost feel could be more powerful if she was played by somebody else. Like here. Like here, when she's comforting this little girl whose mother is dying. Like, fuck man, this should be a way more powerful scene than it already is, but she just misses the mark. Maybe it was the direction, but I doubt it, and what I find funny is that she was obviously a new actress, which is okay, I hope I wasn't too harsh. But her Wikipedia page says, and she did very well in it. Which I just think is really funny. It sounds like they're talking to her like she's a dog. She did really, really good. I thought she came back for more Shawa era films, but apparently all she did was the Mysterians. She did reprise her role in Godzilla vs. Desertroya. So I'll be excited when by 2030, when I finish reviewing the other roughly 20 films to get there. She died three years after Desertroya came out in 1998. And I hope she rests in peace. Little little thing I, I forgot about when I was writing this. It's really sad that when Godzilla 98 came out, the first American Godzilla movie, it also killed one of the main leads. <laughs> it was that bad. Yeah, don't go watch that. Anyway, if I had a problem with the female lead, the male is useless. See, there's this love triangle going on. Dr. Sarazawa is in an arranged marriage with Emiko, but as Tom and Jerry put it, no, Horace. I can only be a sister to you. And she's in love with this guy looking like he should be in a Shemu prequel. And besides going with Sarazawa to set up the weapon to kill Godzilla, she does nothing but hold Emiko and cuck Sarazawa. In my honest opinion, the story could have been stronger if both characters are combined into one. Emiko's father is a scientist who believes that Godzilla shouldn't be killed, and maybe he and the new lead, you know, combined of the two, could have had ideal differences that causes fights. This obviously needs to be fleshed out, and there would be some flaws that need to be ironed out, but I truly believe that that would have been stronger. The rest of the human scenes without our leads are much, much stronger. A lot of them directly show how tragic an event like this would be, something that is definitely not covered in Kong or its other predecessors. There's a scene with her mother and her kids, and while crying, she tells them that they are going to go see daddy soon in heaven. And that is super fucked. Imagine if in Kong, when the native goes to grab her child, instead of getting away, she and her son cower for their lives while you see the shadow of Kong's foot. I can guarantee that scene would have been cut from any reissues with like the other violent scenes. There's also a scene that is used to convince Sarazawa to destroy Godzilla when they watch a group of schoolgirls singing a sad song. All of this convinces me that the film didn't need the human plot. It should have been filmed without main characters because the best scenes with humans are usually the ones without them involved. But of course, what we are all here for and something they still don't understand, looking at you King of the Monsters 2019, is the monster himself. Unpopular opinion, they should have held off on making Godzilla movies in color until the 80s. Because in this and its direct sequel, Godzilla looks way more sinister in black and white than he does in color, at least until the 80s. 
Another advantage of this film is the cinematography, which looked great considering it's a guy in a suit. And according to the crew, the original Godzilla suit weighed like 200 pounds, and it could only be used for three minutes before the poor guy inside collapsed. They ended up cutting in half for close shots and using a less heavy version and more shots, but still. Despite my problems with the movie, it's still one of my favorite films, but no film is perfect. I love this film very much, and if you can find it for an affordable price, jump on it. It, like Kong, is a monster movie masterpiece.